I think today's uh, luncheon is a testament to the brilliance and prescience of our Vice President Ben. Uh, he could not have arranged a talk more appropriate today uh, than the one we're going to get. I'm just absolutely amazed at his ability to foresee uh, the future. And uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Ben to introduce uh, our, our luncheon speaker. Well, I have to admit it's uh, all luck, and I'm not sure if it's good luck or bad luck in this case. But um, uh, Dean Gillis uh, joined the faculty of uh, UC Berkeley as a professor of forest economics in 1983. And he's a member of the faculty of uh, environmental science, policy and management, and the Department of Agricultural and Resource Economics. He served as Dean of Berkeley's College of Natural Resources from 2007 to 2018. Uh, he still remains very active as the secretary of the Berkeley Division of the Academic Senate. Um, he also serves off campus as the chair of the California Board of Forestry and Fire Protection and served two terms on the U.S. Department of Agriculture's Forest Research Advisory Council. Uh, Dean Gillis's research has encompassed structure survival in large urban wildland conflagrations, effects of climate change on fire management, public engagement in the development of community wildfire protection plans, natural hazards impacts and planning, the economic impacts of changes in the harvest levels, and among other projects involving uh, forest resource management. Today, Dean Gillis will outline the current research on California's forests from his unique perspective as a researcher, administrator, and a regulatory and forestry professional. Um, let me just say that if you would like to uh, have, any, have any questions for uh, Dean Gillis, if you use the chat uh, function at the bottom of your uh, Zoom screen, I will be monitoring that and uh, collecting all the questions uh, during Dean Gillis's talk. And now let me hand this over to Dean Gillis. Hi, I'm gonna uh, go into a small box now and uh, share my screen because I have prepared some PowerPoint slides here. Uh, there we go. Um, ben, could you confirm that that's displaying correctly? Yes, it's working fine. Great. So uh, thanks for inviting me into your homes in a rather stressful time. Uh, normally we have one stressor we can point to and today we have at least four. Um, and uh, it's fun to be talking to, uh, especially an audience with so many DOE uh, retirees in it because um, uh, as well as the Berkeley retirees because of all the work you've done in your career. It's a distinguished crowd when you're talking to people that have, you know, spent their lives from my point of view, uh, both uh, advancing the frontiers of knowledge and mentoring those that have taken up the endeavor after you put down your, your burden. So I am now 50 days into my own retirement. Uh, and I'm hoping to emulate uh, your commitment to lifelong intellectual engagement and growth. Uh, even though I don't have to set an alarm clock every time, I was talking with my friend Steve Martin, the former Dean of Biological Sciences there. Uh, Steve set a good example. Uh, he's taking uh, a full course load ever since he stepped down. Uh, and so I'll try and be like Steve uh, with the exception of I own my own Hawaiian shirts, Hawaii having been one of the places I grew up, whereas Steve had to borrow a Hawaiian shirt for his retirement party, uh, uh, that that was not in his wardrobe. Um, so I suggested the topic of filling in the blanks for this talk because I've been really interested uh, in the last couple of years about uh, the status of the nation's research and development infrastructure and forestry. And the project I'm devoting my uh, largest amount of effort to at the moment in retirement is in fact uh, trying to organize a national summit on research and development and forestry uh, that's funded by the USDA's National Institute for Food and Agriculture and by the US Endowment for Forestry and Communities. 
And, um, you know, in that decade where I was the dean of the College of Natural Resources, I witnessed a lot of very disturbing trends in funding for forestry research in particular, uh, in declines in private investment in research and development, in addition to those I was seeing in the university, and some very disturbing trends in the demographics of the scientific community addressing uh, research problems in forestry. A uh, good example of that would be in the area of forest products research, where Berkeley's research footprint uh, is currently minuscule relative to the 10 faculty positions that were working in this area in the Department of Forestry and Resource Management in 1983 when I was hired on in the university. Um, the closure of our forest products lab out on the Richmond Field Station uh, is a scenario that's played out on most land-grant campuses in the United States. Uh, and we are at this point left with a few regional centers of excellence that actually have the critical mass to carry on a serious forest products research endeavor, uh, Oregon State being a, a good example. And uh, another trend that was really disturbing to me that's motivated me to think a lot about research and development in forestry um, was the nation's failure to train and replace positions after retirements uh, in the area of pathology and pest management and forestry. And uh, that's, that's something I observed both in the universities and in uh, federal agencies and state agencies. Um, and our diminished capacity for research development in that area of biology, I'm not talking mostly about biology today, but this is a biological component, uh, was really apparent to everyone in forestry in the state uh, after we experienced a drought of historic proportions, followed by, uh, you know, mortality of, say, 150 million uh, mature trees in the Sierra Nevada from the beetle uh, attacks that follow on trees being moisture stressed. Uh, we really had a very, very uh, small bench of scientists to address that problem. Um, and uh, that same deficiency in our research and development demographics shows up over and over again with invasive pests and pathogens that uh, the number of people that are uh, around and the money devoted to research on things like sudden oak death, uh, golden spotted oak borer, if you're from Southern California, you might be familiar with the mortality that's causing in places like San Diego. Uh, polyphagus or Carruccio shot hole borers, uh, where if you know enough Latin, you know the polyphagus uh, genus name means seem to eat just about everything. Uh, that, that's got at least 50 hosts. Uh, uh, and I've, I've stood on uh, uh, riparian areas in San Diego County where every single willow in the drainage is dead from a shot hole borer infection. And you think, wow, given that uh, most of the actual biodiversity in some of the Southern California areas is in the riparian areas. If you blow out the tree cover of the riparian areas, what is that going to do to the biodiversity where we're trying to maintain? So um, still, you know, uh, that's part of the pitch I'm developing to make to Congress uh, on behalf of the forestry community working with friends. And so uh, we'll have to move on from that. But I think that's my personal motivation for the filling in the blanks title. And uh, part of what I want to still give back uh, is in this research and development area for California and for forestry in general. So not dwelling on forest biology uh, with apologies to Steve Martin, but as he knows, uh, I am a lapsed biologist that I was a forest geneticist until I became allergic to almost all tree pollens. Uh, and so in my fallen state, I became an economist. Um, okay, uh, and uh, the stuff that's going on outside the window means you will probably have some questions that aren't exactly what I'm talking about, and that's great. Uh, but fire is certainly near and dear to my heart as a researcher, and approximately half of my research program over my career is actually addressing fire management issues. So um, our talk today, move this down. Uh, I'm going to talk a little about fire and carbon, which I think are the, the main drivers of forestry research at the moment, and then how that plays into forest products research, building safety research, emergency management research, and biometrics research. And then I'll talk fast so that we have time uh, for questions. And um, 
uh, let's start with what I say the research drivers are. They're Two real drivers from my point of view, especially for the non-biologic part of forestry research, and that's fire and carbon. And it would have also been true if I just said we have one primary driver and that's climate change because fire and carbon are just the two sides of the same coin that is climate change. Uh, but I think it's, it's useful to look at them first separately and then say why these drivers reinforce each other at times, and sometimes they're in conflict. Um, so California actually aspires to lead the nation on carbon policy. Uh, I have, was deeply involved in this report, which is California's forest carbon plan, which is uh, sort of how will we achieve the goals that we started down the path towards under AB 32 when we were trying to monitor greenhouse gases. And uh, in this report, we basically said, you know, we've got some terrible trends going on in wildfire damages, in um, our ability to sequester carbon. Uh, but you could actually reverse this trend that there are active management uh, activities and policies that we can do that would reverse this trend. And a lot of what we're doing in forestry research actually derives from this attempt to move us towards carbon neutrality. Um, uh, and in fact, a lot of the uh, funding for research in the state, whether it's fire related or carbon related, comes out of greenhouse gas funds. Um, so let's turn to fire as a driver. Uh, uh, it's not hard to make the case that this is a critical area. Uh, all you have to do is take a deep breath if you're in the Bay Area right now. Um, and, uh, but I'm an academic, so I need to drone a bit as to why fire is the driver. And two tables uh, that CAL FIRE maintains and updates all too frequently uh, really make the case there. This is uh, the largest fire table, uh, and this is the most destructive. Um, what's important to think about in terms of what are the largest fires here is the dates that there's really only one fire on the top 10 list that predates my hiring at Berkeley. That's astonishing in a century of records here that we're in this situation. Um, and, uh, We've got fires there that are just astonishing in size. Um, and I thought the Rim Fire was big. Uh, I said on public radio back in Minnesota, where I used to work for the Forest Service, they said, how big is this fire? I said, well, it's burned half of Hennepin County, and uh, it's looking to go for the whole county, uh, trying to give a local reference to people in Minneapolis there. Uh, and then we had the fires that, uh, you know, brought us to our knees in, in the Mendocino complex and the Thomas uh, fire, right, one right after another. Um, interestingly, this list as to why fire is the driver shows that destructiveness and size aren't the same thing. They're actually almost orthogonal to each other. Um, that the most destructive fire, you know, you first have to say what makes a fire destructive and most of us would agree that the last two columns on this table are the metric of destructiveness which are structures lost and lives lost. And this, under this list, the, um, the campfire, which is a big but not giant fire, uh, takes first pride of position there with you know, 18,000, nearly 19,000 structures and 85 deaths. I actually thought the death total would be closer to two or 300 at the time. So it's terrible when an outcome is frightful as 85 uh, deaths is actually better than most fire experts were thinking would be the outcome at the end of the day. Um, and it's interesting that this also has motivated a lot of research on uh, power grids, because if you look at the causes, there's an awful lot of power grid electrical stuff going on there. Uh, uh, sometimes it's just poorly done electrical work, uh, but a lot of times it's this power line transmission and our vulnerability there. Um, but it's more than just destroying homes and causing loss of life or burning over acres. It's also a huge problem institutionally for the public safety sector. 
Um, this graphic, which I love because it demonstrates everything that how to lie with statistics tells you don't do, uh, because your eye reads the uh, area of those fire symbols uh, rather than reading the height of the fire symbols, which is what the numbers are based on. Um, great book, How to Lie with Statistics. If you've never read it, go find a copy in a used bookstore and read it. But uh, over just a 20-year period, the proportion of the U.S. Forest Service's budget that had to be devoted to fire has gone from just 16% uh, up to where it's, it's well over 50% of the budget. Uh, and this trend has been so severe that we've had to change the entire way, which is just in effect this year, that you budget for uh, fire suppression in the country because it was regularly causing the diversion of budget uh, resources from the research or programmatic parts of the Forest Service over into fire suppression. And the only money that you were getting as a Forest Service collaborator tended to come at the end of the year when it's suddenly, all right, we do have some money that won't be scooped out of research and dropped into suppression. Can you get this contract approved in two days? And you just, you know, this is not the way to spend money. Uh, but then almost everyone on this call knows about that end of budget year rush. Um, it also causes problems at the state level. And so this is a graph where the, the top uh, area is emergency funding. That's like spending on suppression. And the green is sort of the base stuff that's already in the budget before any fires break out. And you see both the cyclicality of fire damage, but also the inexorable trend up. So you've got a problem with paying for fire management. Uh, that means it's a great area for problem solving research. Uh, this is really what got me into fire uh, science that an earlier peak uh, had Cal Fire reach out to me and say, we heard forestry hired an economist help. Uh, and I thought that's interesting. There's also the, the market impacts. And here's just a, a screen capture of some PG&E stock prices after the campfire. Uh, and you think about how much uh, retirement system and household wealth was wiped out uh, in addition to uh, the damages that people in areas like Paradise suffered. So tremendous driver for research. Um, but how do the two relate together, the, the fire and carbon? Um, essentially, uh, they're linked because if you've got carbon in a forest and it burns, it's not sequestered. And forests that have been under custodial management in the sense that there's very little forest products harvesting going on, um, actually burn at a rate that might be three times that of an intensively managed industrial forest. Uh, and so we have this disjoint philosophically, uh, especially as Californians, between our willingness to accept active management on the landscape and the consequences of active versus custodial management, especially after decades of fire suppression, on whether or not the objectives that we think protecting the forest uh, for are actually being achieved. So this problem is severe enough that major portions of the Sierra Nevada are not carbon sinks. They are carbon emitters. And this is particularly acute for areas under Forest Service uh, sort of custodial management where there isn't a lot of harvesting going on, but there has been effective fire pr pr protection going on, suppression for quite a while. Um, I frequently said uh, to the governor's office, you know, we have a philosophical battle here about whether or not management is actually successful or inherently so flawed that to protect the environment, we need to not manage. Uh, it's an interesting problem. All right, so those are the drivers. What are we doing about it? First, forest products research. Um, you wanna get a lot of wood out of the forest. We know that we can reduce uh, losses of habitat and forest cover and prevent type conversions to brush and prevent losses of infrastructure if in fact we have a market for the wood that's in forests, especially in the small trees, the stuff that you look at and you say, well, that's not going through a sawmill, or it would have to go through a very specialized sawmill that gets one two by four out of a, a log. Um, 
And this has a tie in to the work of the DOE, certainly, in that using wood in buildings can really, in a life cycle analysis, have some very positive impacts, uh, both in terms of steel versus wood as building materials and in terms of meeting IPCC guidelines for sequestering carbon in a product for the century that's necessary to consider it sequestered. Right? So we're looking at this and saying we need to think how to have a, 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 a bunch of opportunities to use forest products. Um, the most promising that I want to leave you with is the take home message for where the research is going and what's most exciting is uh, the use of mass timber products like cross laminated timber. That's where you create wood panels uh, to, and you can use them. Uh, you build them off site and you can bid mid to even high rise buildings out of wood. Uh, and they're great. They have great fire characteristics. Uh, you know, you're not creating a hazard by building a building out of wood. They have great seismic characteristics because uh, these cross laminated timber panels are very strong. They have great structural uh, kind of di dimensional stability and they're quite rigid. Um, and the California Building Standards Commission just last week adopted tall wood provisions to allow more use of mass timber products in California construction. And uh, the board that I chair, the Board of Forestry and Fire Protection, uh, wrote a letter in support of this move. And, you know, it's, it's interesting because it's not just a way to solve a fire problem and a rural economic problem. The buildings you can make with this stuff are remarkable and the aesthetics of them, uh, at least to my eye, uh, is astonishing. Just as a couple examples, I've, I've held uh, meetings of the Board of Forestry in this building, uh, partly because the acting supervisor at the time is one of my former PhDs, Rachel Smith. Um, this is the Angeles National Forest Supervisor's Office. It's, it's a gorgeous building. Um, and quite functional. Uh, this is an example of how you can use them in residential development. This is student housing, or, or it's housing developed for the student market in Charlotte. Uh, and you can see all of the use of uh, wood in there that's replacing steel, which results in the, the positive energy impacts. Uh, and here's an example in Iowa of how you'd use it for commercial properties. Um, so most of the places where you would have expected steel in this building, there would. Fabulous stuff. It's really quite beautiful. Um, and, you know, we're pushing it from the forestry end, not just because it uses wood, but we have a housing affordability crisis. And this construction method, as long as you don't eat up all your cost savings in transporting the panels for a long distance, uh, it makes it rapidly accelerates the construction, uh, as you can see from the way pieces are being uh, assembled that are pre-made in the picture at the upper left there. Each of those top pieces is, is already been made. You can actually build uh, apartments or hotels out of this stuff with each unit assembled off-site and you're stacking them up uh, kind of like a multi-story container building. It's, it's fabulous to watch the speed that you can deal this, uh, construct these buildings. Um, and that speed of construction uh, really minimizes the site disturbance, uh, decreases the construction cost, but you need more places manufacturing the products. At the moment, a lot of the ones used in California are shipped all the way from British Columbia. Um, if we can use up this wood uh, in these products, and this does not demand a high, a high quality of wood, you know, you've got economic development in the rural areas, um, and you've got a, a carbon friendly alternative to your use of non-renewables like steel. So there's a lot to be said for this stuff. Um, and uh, one of the things that I've been very actively engaged with uh, was working to get the state to fund, and we have secured the funding. We created a um, something called the Joint Institute for Wood Products Innovation, uh, and we put out our first report from this this group. And um, this is 
a wonderful effort where we tried to say, where are the real opportunities in forest products to, to use some of this stuff that just gets piled up in the woods? You know, it's low value. And we've done the analysis. We think there are three winners uh, where uh, private investment money could be leveraged with public, uh, with good outcomes uh, for both the business side of it and the ecological side with mass timber being the top, liquid and gaseous transportation fuels following that, uh, and chemically and thermally treated wood as a third. We, we analyzed everything that was on the table. Uh, and um, one of the things that really stands out about this study was we analyzed everything rigorously using uh, criteria, the feedstock required, the carbon storage it would entail, the technological readiness of the sector. Is this a gleam in your eye or is this a, a, a nearly mature or mature technology? What feedstocks would it use and how would that feed back into our, our objectives in the wood? Is there a market for this beyond just California? How big is that market? How many research uh, elements still need to be filled in? What are the blanks? And this is an example of the summary for mass timber. Uh, all of the products were analyzed there. It's not an advocacy report for any one of all the products we considered. It's a comparative evaluation from a neutral stance. And, uh, you know, mass timber, those kind of beautiful buildings, does come up as really one of the very uh, good elements. Looking at the other things, things like liquid and gaseous transportation fuels. For those of you that might have had some association with the Energy Biosciences Institute, I did. I did some work for them on competition for wood feedstock for the paper industry versus the solid wood sector versus the energy sector. Um, uh, we found there that a lot, we, we, we came up with a lot of technology advance and scientific advance, but uh, the implementation of that really depends critically on the price of energy and on what our nation's carbon policy is going to be. Um, and so uh, how fast we move on some of these other elements, uh, it's easy enough to incentivize mass timber, you use government contracting, you make sure lead certification works, um, uh, you change the building codes without people asking, uh, based on the science, but with things like biofuels for uh, transportation sector, uh, it really depends on uh, what the price of oil is, which of course depends on what your carbon policy is, which depends on whether you're going to put a tax on carbon, where you capture some part of the social cost of carbon. Uh, and if you read our policies at the national level over the last four years, we have systematically destroyed any credible estimation process for the social cost of capital, taking it from, you know, $150 a, a ton down to something absurdly small that says, don't worry about it. So hopefully we'll reverse that kind of environment soon. Uh, and we've got a research priority set up for the state, uh, which I think uh, is smart. Uh, it's got time scales in there recognized, like we have to work with people like Oregon State uh, to get this kick started. We've, we're in fact sending white fur up there right now to see if the layups for mass timber are any different than the ones you'd use for dug fur or ponderosa pine. Uh, that involves a lot of physics, uh, wood testing of panels and things. Um, and, uh, you know, use the, the state's leadership uh, in climate change mitigation to uh, promote this kind of opportunity to sequester carbon and products. So we, we've done a lot of good work on that. I'm very proud of that. I serve as co-director of the Institute. Uh, my only reservation about that work to date was how difficult it was to get Berkeley to take the damn money. <laughs> um, that I, 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 it's called a joint institute because I'm trying to create an environment for both uh, UC and CSU scholars to work on these issues uh, collectively, jointly. Uh, and I found it impossible to drop, you know, a half million dollars into the CSU system, but possible by working my personal connections as a former dean uh, within research administration to get it through uh, the door into Berkeley. So sometimes it feels like the place doesn't want to take money. 
Um, I'm going to move on quick. I want to talk a bit about building safety research, given fire and carbon are our drivers. Um, a close friend of mine, Steve Quarles, who used to be with UC Cooperative Extension, but ended his career as the chief scientist for wildfire and durability for the uh, what's called the Insurance Institute for Business and Home Safety, uh, recently gave some wonderful testimony to Congress on some of the work that we've been doing in this area. This is an example of uh, a house lost in the Angora fire. And what does this tell you if you look at it as a fire scientist and you say, we have lost this home entirely and yet the vegetation around the home has not burned. So that's saying, hmm, houses aren't necessarily being lost by being overrun by flame. The flame is coming to the fire in the form of embers and the house is lost without it being carried necessarily to the house by the vegetation. So don't think like a forester, think like an engineer. Um, and so thinking like an engineer, Steve had the most fun toy to work with of any experimental scientist I've known. This is uh, a mock-up of a home. And I don't mean like the kind they use in the movies that's a small scale. Those are two guys in Nomex suits in the upper right corner. So if you see the size of the people, you realize this is a scale dwelling at which Steve had the infrastructure to pour ember loads of whatever size and type he wanted under different wind speed scenarios. Talk about a fun piece of equipment to work with. And what did he show in this research? It shows in a duplex where there's a combustible wall, single pane windows, and a bark mulch on the left side of this structure, and a non-combustible siding material, uh, hardened double pane windows, and a rock mulch on the right, exposed to the same ember load, this is the consequence. And watching the process of ignition, the embers would ignite the, the bark mulch that would spread to uh, the combustible siding and enter the house into the attic through vents which weren't fire screened. So it's pointing out all the vulnerabilities with many traditional construction and landscaping things. Um, so we actually know a lot based on Steve and other people's research like studies going back to one I did in Santa Barbara, which was quite useful in getting the Bates Bill uh, passed banning wood shake shingle roofs uh, that I, I was able to study every house in the Santa Barbara Painted Cave Fire and show that as long as you were maintaining your vegetation to legal clearance distance and didn't have a wood roof, your house had had an 85%, as I remember, uh, chance of surviving that fire. But if you had a wood shake roof and you didn't maintain your vegetation around the house, it was gone. <laughs> and that was a nice sample for 900 houses within the fire structure. So the question is, how do you move from this to actually um, implementing these practices? And there we run into the same problems that you run into with uh, achieving ADA compliance or uh, achieving uh, modern code in existing uh, buildings. What is going to be your policy trigger to require retrofitting? And who's gonna pay for the retrofitting? And that's a more complex question than most people realize because there are both positive and negative externalities associated with people retrofitting to these standards as opposed to just requiring them for new construction. If you don't fix your house, there is a negative externality in the form of you have increased the risk you pose to your neighbor's property. If you do, especially if you do it as collective action at say a block level, you have dramatically created a positive benefit for each other. So um, that says, Golly, uh, am I, you know, 
Am I responsible for my neighbor's actions? Should I assist my neighbor? Should we as a whole take community action and create fire protection districts? Should the state provide uh, access to capital markets under very favorable terms, the same way that I'm sure some of the DOE people here know, City of Berkeley uh, figured out, well, if we want to get solar panels, how about we pay for it, uh, the access to capital, and just tack on the fee to service the debt at our rate to your property tax bill so that there is no access to capital limitation. Uh, and in rural areas, access to capital is frequently a problem. So this is wonderful, but the, the policy work is just starting and it's hitting my desk right now in the sense that the legislature is considering adding to our existing fire safety rules uh, that the board I chair writes uh, we have regulations we have created over time that require certain management uh, to be done to vegetation within 100 feet of a home in a high fire hazard area, uh, rather intensively managing uh, within 30 feet of the structure and a little less intensive over the next 70 feet. That's science-based, those distance, they do work out in policy. Uh, is based on science whenever we can. Um, but we're thinking about adding a five foot ember resistance zone around the house. And uh, I'm hoping uh, that people's attachment to the traditional aesthetics of vegetation within five feet of their home, and Steve varied this boundary of ember resistant stuff around the structure. We know five feet's what you need seven feet on a quarter in case the wind is incident on the corner, but um, we know what it should be. Uh, the state is thinking about this. Uh, if you maintain this and it's linked to insurance markets, you could incentivize the behavior which would generate all these positive uh, externalities uh, among neighbors, but um, that does run into your issue of uh, what your feeling is about the role of government and size of government. So nothing's a given on this, but we know the science of what making just this change, this what, what are you gonna do on the ground? You know, allow wood mulch or vegetation next to the home or put something uh, that's very ignition resistant there. Um, I'm gonna go really fast here. Uh, I wanna talk a bit about emergency management because uh, I know I've been talking for nearly 40 minutes. Um, I find emergency management research a lot of fun, uh, even though you frequently step back and uh, you have to reflect for a moment at the tremendous uh, kind of emotional, physical, uh, financial uh, toll that emergencies from natural hazards uh, inflict on Californians. And um, we need some new responses here. And I wanted to say this is not entirely a wildfire problem that natural hazards researchers actually share a lot between people that work in different hazards. So earthquake researchers, fire researchers, people that work on hurricane response, uh, they all read the same literature. Um, and uh, the, when I gave you the table at the beginning about the most destructive fires, I said one of our two main metrics is loss of life. And loss of life, we know from our record at this point, is mainly associated with the evacuation phase of emergency management. And it's, that's not just a California finding. If you follow the news on this subject, you find that this is a worldwide phenomenon. These uh, are all fires in Mediterranean ecosystems, like the one we have in California. These are all uh, high death totals because of events and evacuation. And maybe some of you read the news coverage of those 2018 fires in Greece, which were really tragic because it was a very small choke point uh, preventing evacuation from people that were on foot. Um, so it's a big problem. Civilian fatalities are mostly in the evacuation phase, but uh, anything we can do to improve evacuations has to work for all natural hazards. You can't have an app for every natural hazard and expect to effectively communicate with people, right? You need one approach to natural hazards, especially when you face multiple hazards like the Berkeley Hills. We have both fire and we have uh, earthquake issues. So 
I'm working with some people uh, that are sort of taking off from this recent National Academy study, basically saying, boy, we need to do better messaging. And we need to figure out how to motivate the cognition of risk, which makes the transition to action functional, right? Um, so that has to be quite nuanced in that the risks are, are different in every area. Uh, uh, people don't deal with low probability events well. Um, their perception of risk is very strongly tied to personal experience and has a very short half-life. Um, so anyway, how, how would you respond to this? Well, I've been working with a group of people for the last uh, couple months that were responsible for a great study of uh, the campfire and the evacuation failures in this and looking at the problems of how do you both communicate, but how do you get a community prepared to effectively evacuate, uh, especially when you have failures going on like cell phones failing. Uh, you know, having an app for that doesn't matter if your cell phone doesn't work. Um, and so I've been working with this group and we have a, a research proposal into the office of the president uh, from people at several UCs, from engineering, business, natural resources, uh, that would do something kind of fun. It, we look at something like digital twins and social gaming. So what we're talking about is how do you improve the cognition of risk and the, the way in which the cognition of risk translates into action. And to do that, we'd use uh, some digital twins, and these have already been created for the town of Bolinas, uh, where you marry um, network representations of things like the traffic patterns, uh, the fire movement, uh, the other infrastructure like water or traffic lights, um, with uh, gaming modules where you're using modding gaming interfaces with people from the community so that you actually get them to understand the dynamics of evacuation in their community in the way that they currently process information. So the gaming interface as opposed to an old fashioned board interface becomes critical to gaming this out with people in a way which changes their cognition of risk. Uh, it's like my daughter and I each shared the same article with each other yesterday, the permanent closure of our favorite dim sum restaurant, Tong Kiang up on Geary. And uh, she sent the, the, the article to me uh, in a text message. And I said, yeah, I sent you this link yesterday in email. Talk about a generational divide. So uh, people, you, you need to reach them the way they actually communicate with each other and the way they, they interact with their environment. So we think this gaming could really work. And if this works, this is so cool. I have enjoyed working with these traffic engineers and people that actually are from the computer video gaming world so much that this would be a fun thing for you to get somebody to talk to you about that. Um, and, you know, stay tuned on that one. Uh, that's one of those projects that's so much fun that um, I'm willing to stay really active with as a research, as long as I don't have to manage the budget of the people. A decade as a dean means I don't want to manage budgets anymore, and I don't want to manage people anymore, and I'm sure Steve Martin will agree with me on that one. Uh, we have managed through too many crises together. Um, and so I was going to say some stuff about biometrics research. I'm just going to say it's fascinating that we have the development of competing systems to address the problem of if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. And with carbon and with fire, we have competing ways to gather data. One is the US Forest Service's forest inventory and analysis plots. <clears throat> These are a dense network of plots uh, which are remeasured at 10 year intervals across uh, most of the forest lands in the country. Uh, they tell us a lot about growth and dynamics and mortality. Um, they provide a baseline uh, and a trajectory for how our forests are responding to climate change, which is utterly irreplaceable, right? Uh, you, if we're going to really study climate change, we need to know what was and we need to know what is uh, to project what's going to be. Um, there's also uh, 
LIDAR imagery, sophisticated modern remote sensing, which gathers data not by sending people out on the ground to measure trees, but remotely senses data at an indi individual tree basis. And I'll just close by saying, it is unfortunate that the advocates of each of these types of data for managing our carbon uh, in the state can't talk to each other very well. Uh, you know, if, if you're used to using a hammer, everything looks like a nail. And at times there is a policy debate going on on how we will manage carbon, which uh, feels to me rooted more in people's familiarity with different systems than with an understanding of how they could be used jointly. Uh, to result in better information on both the status and trajectory of California forests. So, how did I do? F 48 minutes, I was shooting for 45, that's not too bad. That's really good. <laughs> so, I'm gonna pull up the chat function here and expand that. Uh, and uh, too late, uh, so Carolyn Kane, hi Carolyn. Uh, was asking, are we too late to reverse the loss of tree cover? And uh, the answer is an emphatic no, Carolyn, um, not at all. Um, in fact, we were doing a very good job on preventing loss of tree cover in the Amazon uh, until there was a political uh, change uh, going back to using the Amazon as a social safety valve uh, for the urban poor. Uh, and uh, promoting its, its conversion, uh, not just the rainforest, but you know, the Cerrado, the drier forest. Um, and so loss of forest in tropical areas is not inevitable uh, and it is quite policy driven. Uh, and uh, the current president there has been disastrous uh, for this. Um, let me go back up to the top here. Uh, in the US actually our forest cover in most places is increased and uh, you know what the forest cover of the US was and what we're shooting for is fascinating to me um, as someone whose heritage is partly Native American. My, my grandmother uh, was Cherokee um, and you know there's a it, so I read a lot of stuff on Native American land management uh, and just had the fun of chairing a joint search committee on uh, Native American studies and ESPM on uh, Native Americans and the environment. Um, and uh, it's, um, it's unclear what the forest cover would have been in some cases under uh, indigenous management uh, because they use fire a lot and some of what people came to think of as natural for California really reflects our genocidal policies towards California uh, natives. Um, and so what are we managing back for? And what window are you looking to go back to uh, uh, in the US? You know, we have a lot more forest cover or much denser forest cover than when Europeans hit California, but that's because you removed uh, indigenous fire management principles for increasing uh, forage content for grazing and maybe even some of my uh, medical entomology friends say it might have even had an impact that was perhaps deliberate on management of ish it, health issues like Lyme disease. So it, it's fascinating as to what are you managing for and if you go back in the, the, the record um, if you pick different points before the last glaciations uh, or during the last glaciation, some of those forest types that were don't have modern analogs. So uh, what kind of forest we're managing for is, is something that's interesting. And uh, do we manage them in the same places? Uh, the, my successor is Dean of College of Natural Resources, David Ackerley, has done some fascinating work on how home ranges of plant communities will change under climate stress. And uh, if in fact the home range for some plant jumps from being coastal to Sierra or Sierra to coastal, is the right way to manage those forest types and their associated vegetation to try and lock it in to uh, 
what it was 5,000 years ago or lock it into what it was 200 years ago or lock it into what it was 50 years ago. Uh, so fascinating question with all kinds of anthropological overtones. Uh, sorry for the long answer. Um, uh, near Mount Rushmore is an experimental culling of trees to stop bark beetle. How did it work? I'm not sure how that experiment worked. Uh, if trees uh, are getting hit with beetles, uh, an infected tree becomes an infection center and actually with some species becomes a pheromone signal that brings additional beetles in is kind of like there's good eating here. Uh, and we saw that in the Sierra and after this drought all the time that it was important to take trees out so that they weren't sort of attractive nuisances bringing in other beetles to hit stress trees that were nearby. Uh, so that is a standard technique uh, with these beetles where their dispersion is pheromone driven. Um, where do Sierra Club and like organizations come down in your thoughts? They can be a little bit knee jerk. Um, I generally have a good relationship with environmental organizations and with industry. Um, one member of the California forest industry kind of group once said to me, Keith, uh, we all know you're a, a liberal Democrat, but we've all agreed you're the sanest liberal Democrat we know and nobody owns you, uh, which is one reason maybe that they, they kind of like my engagement with, with forest policy because I'm very science driven on this. And I find most of the environmental organizations want the same thing. It's not universally true, some are single issue, but groups like, uh, say, the Nature Conservancy are actually very progressive uh, in their thinking about how you uh, integrate livelihoods with landscapes uh, and understand uh, what management of lands does in terms of other ecological objectives like habitat preservation, prevention of type conversion from forest to brush fields. So, um, I'm a very independent person. I guard my independence very zealously. Um, and so uh, I don't think the environmental community thinks of me as an industry shill and the industry sure knows I'm not an industry shill, but they don't think I'm a knee jerk, uh, you know, woodsman spare that tree. Uh, that I, I am about management. Uh, it is my specialty. I've written two textbooks on forest management. Um, in biofuel usage, have you factored in the health impacts from air quality degradation? Yeah, you know, um, this is fascinating. And when I used to teach uh, uh, the environmental economics and policy one class for ag econ here on campus, uh, the complexity of the interactions between uh, the specifications of the Clean Air Act for taking no action that would degrade air quality in a non-attainment region like Southern California is most of the time, um, mean that as much as I might like to reintroduce fire uh, uh, in a substantial way in that area, it's simply not consistent with the way um, Congress I think in its wisdom, literally, not facetiously, uh, said we need to prevent people from end running the notion that air quality standards based on the susceptibility of the vulnerable members of society uh, should be our, our standard. Uh, now, uh, the hard part of that for forestry is uh, non-attainment uh, regions in air quality where you did some prescribed burning, you would have worse air quality. Uh, if you have major fire events, you have huge spikes. What I'm uh, interested in hearing out of the public health community, and there is not an absolutely clear answer to my read yet, is whether or not we would be better off with uh, some degraded air uh, as a result of prescribed fire activity or uh, spikes, episodic spikes of extreme uh, degradation air quality. Uh, what is, you know, the, both the acute and the chronic impact in public health of those issues? Um, overall, the use of biofuels uh, and their uh, 
emissions profile, uh, my read of the literature is that uh, a controlled combustion and transformation into uh, different fuel sources uh, could result in the same sort of management uh, footprint in the forest, but at a much lower impact on air quality than you might see through an expansion and prescribed fire or uh, allowing the current wildfire regime uncontrolled to proceed. Um, some vegetation is more explosive, uh, wood, mulch versus juniper, some plants more fire, sensitive, fire sensitive. Are those the compromise in neighborhoods? Yeah, you know, it, it matters what plants you, you put in, but even eucalyptus, if it's well watered, uh, can actually act as a fire break. So, the condition of the vegetation, the total amount of fuel loading your vegetation represents, and the spatial patterning of the vegetation as fuel loading relative to uh, infrastructure uh, or critical habitat um, really becomes more important than the species mix. Uh, and so I find things like lists of plants that are fire resistant not as important by any means as lists of plants that have low water demand. And so if you actually manage for low water use, you will accomplish almost all of your objectives indirectly for fire resilience. Uh, and so that's really the issue. And that's the way our, our patterning uh, of vegetation management around homes within the first 30 feet or the next 70 feet, or potentially within the first five feet. It's all about how much loading there is and what's its proximity to what you're trying to protect. Uh, one of the perverse things about that that we've observed is fire co or riparian corridors where we've been very restrictive on activities uh, like logging. Uh, built up a lot of forest biomass in the state so that you can really pick them out uh, visually. It's very dense vegetation. You know, there's more water availability, but there's also more protection. And I've seen a number of instances where uh, a riparian corridor that had been well protected under those rules became like a wick. And so a fire was relatively innocuous on the landscape, but fired up the riparian corridor because there was so much fuel there because we had been so protective of it. So I hope that that doesn't sound too rambly, but um, on the other hand, uh, I also like native plants. Uh, so I, I wouldn't personally have thought you should transform the Berkeley Oakland Hills to a eucalyptus Monterey pine forest, given that Monterey pines natural range is just down on the Monterey Peninsula and eucalyptus is after all an Australian tree. Uh, whose introduction to the U.S. with the advocacy of people like Tilden was so disastrous and so economically misleading that the Forest Service had to issue a circular early in the last century that said, there is no conceivable market for this wood. <laughs> and so you shouldn't be buying uh, shares in eucalyptus plantations. Uh, it was the emu farm scheme of 1900, frankly. Sometimes well-intentioned, but we brought a lot of plants into some of those areas where we just have too much vegetation. Uh, Carol and Kane, in the last few days, evacuation orders have been ignored till we have to, oh yes. Uh, endangering first responders, not just endangering first responders, but taking them off of managing the fire to managing the people, such that if you read interviews that I've given uh, over the years about uh, fire management and especially evacuation, um, the early stages are of any fire are all about public safety. They're not about managing the fire. And that means that you've diverted most of your first responder effort away from the fire. Uh, trying to talk to people that have less information to get them to fully understand their risk and move from cognition of risk to action. And that problem is so severe, that's why I'm, I'm working with this team from engineering and business and gaming to try and say, can we do something about changing that model? Um, it's also a sensitive topic uh, internationally uh, that some of us were contacted after some of Australia's disastrous fires uh, uh, 
uh, the Victoria fires in particular, where I think there were nearly 200 fatalities, where the Australians had been leaders in what you call shelter in place. Because most civilian deaths are in the evacuation phase, prepare your area so that you are safe staying there and can potentially put out a small fire if like an ember uh, ignites your mulch. Um, that works in some scenarios, but in an extreme scenario, uh, you should have been out of there and it delays evacuations too late and you increase the loss of life. Um, so I have tried to be very forceful in every media interview I've ever given to say, know where the, the evacuation orders come from and comply with them immediately. Prepare yourself with your go bag uh, if it's in fire season, right at the door. Uh, know where you drop off your pets uh, so that you don't wait. Uh, know where you can evacuate animals like horses to and, and go in advance of the fire. Don't sit around and wait um, that you will be better served by um, being both prepared and leaving early. But we've only got about, even in areas like Paradise, where they had really great leadership at the city level, uh, their mayor was a transportation person, uh, retired. Um, only, I think, uh, less than 40% of the households had really participated in their ready, set, go style Cal Fire evacuation planning. And so you have this real problem uh, with getting people to prepare mentally ahead of the incident and with responding to direction or anticipating danger correctly and leaving. And this is the rub and we really need to change that model. Uh, fire suppression and forest health. So Steve uh, wanted to know about the linkage there and they are intimately linked. Uh, I will say from a biology standpoint, um, there are far too many stems in the Sierra Nevada. Uh, and the result is that you exacerbate situations of moisture stress, uh, which means you're exacerbating uh, mortality issues uh, by creating a situation where you have a lot of fragile trees and you're inviting in beetle infestations. Um, it's, it's a real problem. Uh, and the part of the reason there are too many trees there is that we have had decades of effective fire suppression. The Smokey the Bear message, uh, which was recognized at one point as the most effective single ad campaign in, in uh, the penetration of its, its simple message to the American public, uh, really uh, created a situation where we celebrated fire suppression to the exclusion of understanding the actual role of fire as the primary ecological driver uh, in all Mediterranean ecosystems. And some other ones, uh, Yellowstone, lodgepole pine is a fire dependent species. Uh, and some of the biology we're trying to protect is dependent upon the lodgepole getting all burned down and coming back. Uh, my first fire was a, a, a Kirkland's warbler uh, habitat bird in Northern Michigan, uh, a tree which can only exist if you burn over jack pine areas, which are sort of like lodgepole pines. Um, and uh, then of course you have to kill the cowbirds that steal their nests and do their eggs and move in after the fire. But, but anyway, um, there's, there's an intimate link between fire suppression, buildup of too many stems per acre, uh, which increases the fire load and the mortality that you experience in stress events. Um, George Lavender, can timberlands be economically harvested without destroying forest habitat? Yes, and uh, California has the strictest forest practice rules in the nation, uh, possibly in the world. Uh, in fact, just a minute, I'm going to get a visual aid. And it's going to show weird because of the background, but if I'm still, this book, uh, rather thick, very small print. These are the forest practice rules for California. This is the part of the public regulatory code that the board I chair writes. 
Uh, and I spent most of yesterday morning dealing with under what circumstances we would allow tethered logging to take place on steeper slopes, uh, which was an attempt to say, all right, this is a new technology where you anchor a piece of logging equipment up on the hill so that it can drag material up and be operating on a slope without causing damage to the soil. And you don't need to build a road to accommodate it. And especially you don't build a cross slope road. But even there where we have a technology which we say, everything we know about where this has been implemented in Oregon, Washington, British Columbia, New Zealand says this is a winner. Um, we still sit down and say, eh, wait a minute, do we actually have any information on how this works on granitic soils, uh, which have slightly different stability than some of the ones where the research was done? So we can harvest uh, in a way which is responsible. Uh, and that thick book of rules is how we say, what kind of protections do you need to give to a riparian corridor to keep sediment from going into a stream? What kind of a buffering around a nesting pair of goshawks or northern spotted owls are necessary to uh, maintain the populations of fragile species like that? Um, we do this better and that's why um, when our current president tweeted, bad forest management, California, uh, at the height of our fire season. I was asked for commentary on that. And I was trying not to be inflammatory, pun intended, um, because we had not yet gotten agreement that FEMA would chip in. Uh, we have an insane system for FEMA allocation of funds, which is overly politicized. Um, <clears throat> and so I was quoted uh, as simply saying, the president's comments are at best uninformed. Now, you can, that's an unbounded statement on one side, you'll note if you are kind of a grammar geek like I am. And uh, it got picked up by Teen Vogue. And I told my daughters, my life is complete. I've appeared on the website for Teen Vogue. How's that for a forester? Um, but uh, it's, we actually do pretty good forest management. There's a lot of tension between the state though, because all these rules, they apply to the private lands. Uh, and the federal government is autonomous uh, in its rules. And we, we operate similarly. Uh, we have California Environmental Quality Act. They operate under the National Environmental Policy Act. Um, we're trying to bridge that gap and the state of California just last week signed an MOU with the Forest Service uh, saying um, we need to not be fixated on the boundaries between our ownerships in our environmental stewardship, especially in areas characterized by checkerboards, uh, you know, kind of the legacy of the railroad land payments. Um, and so we have an MOU to manage stewardship agreements, which will allow money to cross much more easily uh, so that environmental treatments can operate on either side of the Forest Service private boundary. Uh, and I think this could work very well. Although in the short term, what it means is we as the taxpayers of California will be probably paying for a lot of management on the federal lands, which has been neglected. But I'm okay with that. Um, I think I have talked too long and it's 13 minutes after the hour. Uh, I'm not easy to, or e hard to find. Uh, Gillis at berkeley.edu. Uh, if you have some questions that you didn't get into the chat, just let me know. Uh, ben, go ahead. Yeah, let, let me give you one last question here. And then we can uh, have a question from Kim Williams. Can you point us to a few resources for neighborhood homeowner fire best practices? 
Oh, absolutely. And in fact, I'd be willing to work you up an email which you could distribute to your membership or the people that signed up for this. Um, Perfect. There, there are some, some really good sources. In fact, there's almost too much information. Uh, one of the first projects I helped out with in California was developing educational materials for landscapers, uh, for Firewise Landscaping. Uh, it also taught me about air quality because our meetings were in Riverside. And on the third meeting, I walked out of the hotel and I said, who put those mountains there? <laughs> right? Where'd they come from? Um, and, uh, the, you know, this was in the 80s. The air quality was dreadful. Um, but it was interesting as we tried to say on the national level with funding from the National Fire Protection Association, what's the deficit in materials? And in fact, I would say there's almost too much because every state takes the lead in developing things locally and every agency within the state. And this has hit my desk recently um, in some rather pointed comments I made to uh, PG&E about creating its own environment for public outreach in addition to that of the agencies or cooperative extension for educating homeowners on what they should be doing. That confusion of message is, is a bigger problem than uh, your ability to access the right message. Well, ho hopefully you can call the list for us. Yeah. I will. I'll send you what right. I think is best. Well, let, let me thank our speaker very much. And uh, this is a wonderful talk and very, very timely.